so without further ado, I'd like to welcome you to Nigella Lawson and Rosanna Cara. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Alison, for that introduction. And Nigel and I were talking earlier because we were both in New York this weekend and we both almost didn't make it back <laughs> to Toronto. So she beat me to it, actually. She got in last night um, due to the ice storm and I got in just this afternoon, if you could believe it. So we're both here and I'm really looking forward to, to interviewing Nigella tonight. So it's my great pleasure to be here. So Nigella and, and yours. Um, I'd like to start just with a little bit about your background. Obviously, mm -hmm. everybody in the room knows and loves you, but it'd be great to know how you got started in the industry. I know that um, cooking was always kind of something in your background, yes. but you actually graduated as a journalist. I, di I didn't graduate. I mean, I, as a journalist, I graduated in medieval and modern languages. Oh, right. um, That's close to journalism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, the thing is, in a way, um, I feel I'm a, a bit of a fraud um, because I, I'm not really part of the industry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've, I, in, I eat. <laughs> and I, I eat and I like thinking about food, I like writing about food, I like cooking. Um, but I haven't, I haven't had training and I did fall into this world by accident. And I, and I always stress that I'm not a chef because, well, you know, I'm somewhere where people have spent a, a lot of time training and learning uh, a profession, uh, learning enormous amounts of skills. And I want to make it quite clear that I don't pretend to have any of those skills. Um, uh, I appreciate what they do and uh, I'm inspired by what they do. And I think... You know, talking to Chef outside earlier, I think we'd all agree that there's room for us all and different sorts of cooks. Um, but I came into this by accident. Mm -hmm. And even because after all, I'd had a quite a long career as a journalist by the time I wrote my first book. Yes. And I didn't, I, I never, I didn't really know it was going to have recipes in it. I thought it was going to, it was going to be a book about my thoughts about food, and a lot of it are my, my thoughts about food. Always happy to pontificate, <laughs> uh, or really witter on, and so I, I did that. And then at the course of writing that, I had an idea for my second book, the ironically titled "How to Be a Domestic Goddess," <laughs> because I came to baking. Then I'd never really baked; I'd always cooked. You know, from I, I've cooked from mm -hmm. about the age of six. So. I, I suppose um, I lurched. I mean, all the important things in life that happen to one, I think, by accident. By, uh, happen by accident. Right. And, and this was a happy accident, and I, and I do enjoy it. And I've learned a lot by doing it. But I, but I regard myself as a passionate amateur rather than as a professional. Right. So did you, um, I know you did some, you were a restaurant critic for a while yes. as well. What I was a restaurant critic for a while. Um, and it was at a very interesting time in London because it, I started, I was quite young, it was 1985 and it was the beginning of the sort of so-called culinary renaissance. Mm -hmm. So in other words, slightly overdone, a sort of a shadow of nouvelle cuisine, uh, but it was interesting. It, it, you know, you, as all of us know, when we cook in our own homes, sometimes you need, uh, you, you need a certain amount of unbridled excess before you learn what works and what doesn't. And that was really, that, that was the stage that the restaurants were going to uh, then. And it, it was changing, food was changing. Now, every now and then, people would say, but, um, you, kn you know, what do you know? You know, why are you saying these things? You're not, um, you know, you're not a not chef. In the industry, right. and, and I used to say, the day... You take money just from people who are chefs in your restaurants is the day that an ordinary person's view is irrelevant. And I think that when, you know, whoever, whoever is cooking, you're there to give um, pleasure and delight um, to everyone. And I think that it's a bit, you know, you, you shouldn't need to get a menu explained to you for, in order to like the food. If someone needs to say, oh, you know, we thought this would be interesting. And the real truth is, is that in my experiences, ta talented chefs 
are not like that. It's the ones who, who don't have the mm -hmm. talent who feel they want to do what they read about. Uh, they want right. to they be Rene asking. Redzepi, and they're not. Right. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I think all of us, chefs or cooks, uh, eaters, we're united in a love of food, and that really is what matters. But I certainly feel you don't need any more than, you know, you don't need to have a doctorate in literature to be able to uh, read a novel. You certainly don't need any sort of uh, training in writing to write a novel. I mean, imagine telling Dickens that, or Shakespeare. Um, so the reality is that I think I always, when I wrote about restaurants, just like when I write about cooking, I'm trying to give an indication of what, um, what it, what it might have felt like that night to eat in that restaurant. And, that's, and there are many things that go into a restaurant experience. Um, whether it's too noisy, whether someone smiles at you the minute you walk in, with the most important thing, I think, in a restaurant. And whether, you know, whether it never matters, you know, like whether you cook or when you bring a dish to a table, it doesn't matter if you make a mistake. You could be charming and apologize. When people get mm -hmm. defensive, it doesn't work. So all those things, I always want to give, I wanted to give an account, this is what it feels like. Because um, when people are deciding whether they go to a restaurant or not, yeah, of course they're thinking about the food, but they're also thinking about the night out they're having and whether it's worth them paying their hard-earned cash on it. And I think that should be respected and not, you know, you, not, not that you only have a view if you're a chef. Sure. No, and I, so I suppose that's what interested me always. And I think just coming at it a bit from an, as an outsider. So your food is very approachable. You know, when you look at your cookbooks, the recipes are very approachable. They're uncomplicated. I think that's what people really enjoy about your food as well, that, you know, it gives pleasure, um, as you said. Um, what motivates that philosophy for you? I mean, when you're choosing to put a cookbook together, what kind of dishes are really fueling your, your appreciation? Well, it, it happens really the other way around, which is I cook, and some of the things I cook uh, morph into recipes Dishes. with my help. Right. Um, and some just become, well, that was, that's great, you know, it's something to do. Is it, is it really a recipe? I don't know. And sometimes I put those, is it a recipe? I don't know recipes in as well as suggestions. Mm -hmm. But when I cook first, I'm not weighing or measuring um, or timing. Right. And then I, from that, because I'm just seeing, I mean, I, obviously I'm paying attention, but I'm not looking at, at my watch or setting a timer. I'm just seeing what happens. And then from that, it becomes a recipe, and I think, oh, that really worked. I like the, that mixture of ingredients. I might have been clearing out my fridge. <laughs> and then I like this. And so then I... Great motivator. And that, well, of course. Yeah. And then it, then it seems to become a recipe. Right. And I think that in a way, in, in common with, um, I suppose, a lot of home cooks, and certainly the food I eat in other people's homes and the food I make in my own, is that it's not technique-heavy. So it relies on... Um, the um, flavor and flavor, as we all know, also relies on texture. So you know, you're using, you are making uh, judgments about how you want to go, but it, you're not actually um, being so systematic about those judgments. I'm not, I'm not always mm -hmm. aware of what criteria I'm, I'm applying. So you're going really by the heart. I'm going by the heart, by the and, and and also I, I, sometimes I can tell which. What I what I'm repeating, what I'm what I have to return to, and that tells me something. Um, and I'm often inspired by by going out. You know, I always say about how cooks and chefs are different, but I'm very inspired by going out, and I might eat something, and it might open my eyes to, to a particular way of cooking, which um, when I'm in my own home. I have to do differently because we're all aware that in a restaurant there there's a whole team of people, whereas at home, just you. you know, it's just me. And also, I'm I don't want um, I don't want to add enormously to the washing up. So I <laughs> feel I and I not order the shopping. So I'm really trying to think how, there's something there that speaks to me as well as a home cook that I really um, that I really love. And how can I make it work at home? And and that, I, and I enjoy that. Do you start off with a, a theme? Do you have an idea? No, it's, no, I, I no once theme? did, but I once did. When I did Nigelissima, I knew I wanted to do a book of uh, all sort of Italian-inspired right. recipes. But generally, I don't have a theme. But you know, so I will explain to you, for example, how I will turn things. When I was in Melbourne, 
Um, not, I was in Melbourne recently, but I was there the time before. I went to a restaurant called Ghazi where I had these incredible chips, fries, fat fries. And they were fried in garlicky oil um, with dried oregano, tossed in dried oregano and crumbled feta. And they were really, really <laughs> wonderful. Everybody's getting hungry, I can see. And um, so when I wanted to, th I was thinking about them when I was at home, although I have cooked, um, you know, I have cooked fries. And in fact, I was inspired by some Italian, Italian restaurant fries once, and my Tuscan fries, things when I cooked them with herbs and with whole cloves of garlic. But I wanted to use those flavors in a way that was just easier for me at home. And I chopped the potatoes and roast them in, in cubes with garlic and dried oregano. And then when they come out of the oven, I crumble feta and use some fresh oregano. So as far as I can see, these are very different sorts of dishes. And yet they're related. And one is manageable in the course of making Sunday lunch, and one isn't. And um, you know, in a way, I, w I mean, I do do. I, I will deep fry on occasion, but really, for me, you know, if I go to a restaurant and there's anything deep fried on the menu, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, what I really want to do is, I want, I, I want to get one of those army catering tents so that I can deep fry in my garden, because it's just that I live in a kind of open plan space. So deep frying, you have to be, you have to go all in, because that's it. The cushion covers everything for a week. She's a woman after our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> you relate to your cookbooks more as, um, not more as a manual, but more as a collection of stories and emotions and memories. And you've written 11 of them, as we've heard. Is there a, a, a special food memory that you can share with us from any of those books that really stands out for you? Well, I suppose I'd have to talk about my mother's praised chicken in Kitchen. Um, and it's on my website if you, anyone wants the recipe. But it's a, it's, it's, I cooked it for so many years before it even occurred to me to put it in a book because it's not really, I mean, you know when you cook something so repeatedly, it doesn't seem like doesn't a recipe. It doesn't seem special, right. Um, and uh, my mother died very young when she was 48. And this was something we used to have most Saturday lunchtimes, which it was chicken cooked in a pot with water on the stove with leeks and carrots, and then we'd always have it with uh, a rice on the side. And she used to make sometimes an egg and lemon sauce, but otherwise it was, but it's very intense flavored. I changed it a bit. I put dry white vermouth or white wine in it, which she didn't. And I put uh, a lot of peppercorns. And it is, it's, it's not chicken soup and it's not a chicken stew. I mean, I always say that I call it praised because it's, it's a kind of a mixture between braised and poached and both cooking it and eating it are an act of devotion. But I love it, and I love it, and why it means a lot to me as well is that, you know, it's a way that my children can get to eat my mother's food. And I think food, home cooking is a legacy. Um, and we're either evoking memories or we're creating new ones. And that, to me, is, is immensely important. But you're right to say, you know, I do, you know, I, I think a good cookbook has to be many things. I think it has to be, a wholly reliable manual. Mm -hmm. I think every recipe has to work and it has to be very easy to follow. But it also should give you pleasure reading it as you would read any other book. And for me, that's as important. But, but the one, no one part overshadows the other. There's no point loving a book and it makes you want to eat and then you follow a recipe and it doesn't work. Sure. So you have a fondness for Italian cuisine, excuse I do. me. Um, what drove that? Well, I lived in Italy for a year when I was 19, and I've been back almost every year since. Um, and I was quite shy. I was very shy, really, as a you child. Were shy. Yes. <laughs> I'm, do you know, I can be shy now just because I, you know, that, uh, well, shy, you know, I mean, if I'm with shy people as well, it, I get, it's contagious, I get it back again. <laughs> but I am quite, I am quite shy, but when I, I think going to Italy made a real difference because I somehow, when I spoke a different language, I became a slightly different person in you Italian. Shy? I wasn't a shy in Italian, I was much more outgoing. <laughs> and I, 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 in a way, you, it's also very 
relaxing, I think, to go, liberating to go somewhere where um, you're just you afresh. Mm -hmm. Because when you're young, the chances are you always meet people who know your parents and your family and your siblings, and you're always seen in that way. And then you go and you have to, you know, I had to earn a living, make a name for me, right. like be me, Since just me. And I was independent. And I also, um, I always cooked. I cooked from a very young age. I was brought up in an England which was very Francophile, and French cooking was what everyone aspired to. But then I went to Italy, and it changed everything for me. And uh, it was the sort of food I liked eating. I think that's where you get the approachability of the food, because Italian think. cuisine, I mean, I'm Italian, you know, born and raised. Yes. Um, it's very approachable. You know, it's, it's not fancy, but it's it very, very good, and it's very sustainable. I think, you know, I always say that I'm sure it was a French person who, um, uh, you know, an Italian person who said this, but it's true that, that something I said in one of my programs, which the French, um, French food draws attention to the cook and, or the chef, and Italian food draws attention to the food. food yeah. And I think there is some truth in that, not entirely, not perhaps in bourgeois French cooking, but certainly mm -hmm. in haute cuisine. And I think the, 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 the real truth is, is that the food that is just there about um, the flavors on the plate um, is a wonderful thing. And you don't feel intimidated before you start. Exactly. And that, that's important. You don't feel intimidated as the cook. You don't feel intimidated as the eater. You feel that there's a generosity in that plate that people want you to, to share and to join in. And, um, and I loved it. You know, and I, I, I learned to cook there quite a bit. Uh, and... I mean, a lot of things, I don't know whereabouts in Italy you're from, but... The South. You're from the South, so you're, I learned from a Northern, mm -hmm. and, you know, there, you know, I always say, they put greens. butter, everyone yes. always writes down, no, no, Italians <laughs> don't use butter. Well, Very that's, low count. You know, but that's because <laughs> most people, you know, a lot of people have only encountered Southern Italian sure. food. Yeah. And it is, um, it, they are different, but, I mean, all Italian food, I think, from wherever it is, has a, a vibrancy and an honesty that... Um, just makes me smile thinking of it. Well, that's great. That's wonderful <laughs> that you like it so much. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest on food these days, whether uh -huh. the Food Network has driven that or people's sophistication, more travel. There's also a lot of talk more about healthier foods. Um, how do you feel about the whole healthy food trend movement in terms of, you know, is that something that... Um, is sustainable, or is that just kind of a trend of the day? Are well, we moving I, towards more healthy? No one actually wants to be unhealthy, I mean, clearly. However, I <laughs> think that there is a lot of, an awful lot of mumbo-jumbo spoken, and I feel that people are terribly extreme. I mean, I sort of feel, for example, sometimes, you know, I put cream in a recipe, and get people go, like, so, so much cream, and you think... There's a third of a cup of cream. There are six people eating. I mean, how? How? I mean, get a get a get a grip, you know. And also, I think that it doesn't seem to me to make sense to keep removing whole food groups from from your diet. Right. You eat a bit of everything. I I and also, I mean, I read quite a lot of food science and what uh, and uh, what is regarded as healthy, and it changes all the time. I mean. I've read recently, I don't know how many of you have read a book called Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teicholz, I think she's called. And it actually, the paper's on really um, on how actually eating, uh, you know, meat. I mean, obviously, it depends how it's raised. Meat and butter actually, geez, you actually are not bad for you. And I have to say, and this is now, it, it does not make sense to me that the food that human beings have been eating for so long are going to be worse for you than food that's created in a factory. I mean, actually, you know, vegetable fats that we cook with, I think they were invented in 1911, and there it's an industrial process. How can that be better for you? You know, and um, so it, it seems to me that you can make any study say more or less anything you want it to, and of course we all hang on to the truths that serve our desires uh, most agreeably. Believe, right? um, <laughs> but, and you know, for example, I think there are many, many arguments for being vegan, 
but maybe health isn't uppermost um, because you know there are you it is very easy to be deficient in iron and in vitamin B12 and also uh, nowadays the, the, a lot of vegan food seems to be processed now I have a great I'm a great believer in vegetables and I think as I say there are very good arguments for being vegan you can take the an ecological mm -hmm. argument and you can take um, just strictly in the argument that you don't wish to kill animals now certainly in terms of as human beings the teeth we have and the way and the way our intestines are we are designed to eat meat that doesn't mean to say we have to um, I don't know that I can give a moral argument for eating meat but I do eat meat um, but I certainly feel that I want to eat meat that is I mean I'm in a privileged position that I can that is um, you know mm -hmm. you know grass-fed that is um, in, uh, that is healthy, that is not um, reared intensively, and that sort of thing. And I, I, I have a balanced diet. I always say I, you know, I do eat healthy. I just eat enough for five healthy people. <laughs> and I do well, eat healthy. Well, you sure don't look it. <laughs> um, but you just have to exercise more as you get older. Um, but the thing is that, you know, we do live in an age of fads. I do think that a lot of so-called healthy eating is a cover-up for an eating disorder. And I think people uh, persecute themselves for what they mm -hmm. do eat or what they don't eat. I, I notice as well, just anecdotally, that friends of mine who deny themselves certain foodstuffs tend to binge on it. Well, that's true. And they always say to me, I don't know how you live with so much chocolate in your house. <laughs> and I say, because I don't prevent myself from eating it. I know it's there. And just like when I travel, I came, I came away with eight bars of chocolate <laughs> because I knew I was going to be away for a while. And I know that if I were one of those people who didn't allow themselves to eat chocolate, they'd all have been eaten by now. <laughs> As it is, I think I've only eaten two and a half bars. Just, I've got enough for the remaining two weeks. She's, <laughs> she's got a great psychology to this all. <laughs> so do you think we're hung up about food? I mean, yes. Today? I think we are. I think maybe it's also the privilege, if you like to call it, or the, um, the perhaps decadent corollary of having too much to mm -hmm. eat. Um, choice. Yes, and I do think as well, but I do think there is a reason why we worry. I think we are, we are worried, and we quite rightly so, we are unsure of what's, happened, what, what's behind the food in the supermarkets. And I do think we we feel we're not being told about the what chemicals story. are being put in the food in right. the earth. And we do feel that the world is not safe. And, and so why shouldn't we worry? And I think people do worry. And it, that doesn't mean to say the steps that are taken are always the right ones, but who knows what the right ones are? I don't think any of us does. So how about local food? I mean, there's been a yeah. real big movement in the last decade with local food, and everybody's really into it these days. Um, you have a different kind of view on local food and that maybe we're being a little too elitist with it? I, I do think two things. I think that um, that, well, in you know, big countries, a big country's notion of what local food is is not what a small country's notion. So your, you know, your idea of what local food is takes in a great deal of the of British course. Isles, you know? So um, <laughs> it's, so what I would say is this, is that also if you come from a small grey island, if you eat seasoning and locally, you're going to have parsnips and cabbages and not <laughs> much else yeah. all the time. How are you going to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee? You know, people forget that. And also that it's a... Uh, I do think sometimes people in the food world, are not, you know, it's not so much in the food world, those people generally um, try and... They create such a hierarchy. So in the olden days... Um, the, the peasant class ate seasoning locally, and the rich would um, send people out to faraway lands to come back with pineapple and pineapple trees and build glass houses, and that was considered the chic thing to do. And now that it's people can get, there's air travel and supermarkets will sell you beans from Kenya when it's in the dead of winter, um, it's considered the chic thing to do is only have, you know, roots and tubers grown locally and expensively with a lot of mud clinging to them. And the real <laughs> thing is, is that making a fetish out of any way of eating isn't helpful. 
I, yeah, I know that when I get back to England and it's asparagus season, I will be eating every bit of asparagus I can get. I'll be going to the farmer's market and, you know, getting the Kent asparagus, and I'll be eating a lot. But that doesn't mean to say that I, you know, you know won't eat, won't get a pomegranate that's flown in from California. Mm -hmm. I do. And I, it's not that I'm proud of it, but I don't want to lie about what I do. And, right. um, and I think... We, all, you know, we eat food we have to be from realistic. all over, and right. um, so I don't know what the I certainly don't have the answer because I, perhaps I'm too much of a hedonist and I see something and I want it and I know it'll taste good, so I have it. <laughs> um, there are certain things, you know, things that are, that I don't, that I suppose I don't um, make me a bit squeamish. Mm -hmm. Foie gras makes the idea of that I don't like. I I remember going to in one of those goose farms. Um, in it, France and actually it, right. seeing it. Yeah. Um, but in a way, uh, you know, I do, you know, as I say, I'm not a, I'm not a vegan, so where does, you know... Well, and we've got to where, be realistic where about does, it, as you well, said, put right? anything. Yeah. Yes, but I suppose in a way the people who change things are the unrealistic types. Right. Um, but I'm not really here to change things, and I, and I suppose I feel I'm... I just can talk about what I do, and sometimes it changes. I think that I used to be a bit more militantly anti-seasonal, and perhaps that were, I was slightly doing it on purpose to sort of nudge people. But, and now I've um, now I'm not, and I do I feel much more grateful for eating food when it's in season. But it's also true that um, I suppose one has access. I mean, I don't know quite what sort of food wasteland I'm shortly going to live in, in post-Brexit Britain, but um, <laughs> the, thank goodness for travel. I can <laughs> travel around eating seasonally and locally. Exactly, exactly. So I'd be remiss in not asking about um, how you feel about this whole Me Too movement that has happened in the last year and how it impacts on women in this industry, in food service and hospitality. Mm. Um, obviously, it's a huge subject everywhere in every mm -hmm. industry. What do you think the restaurant industry has to do to empower women to, to be more in control of what they want to do in working in this industry, whether as a cook or a chef? Um, I know you were in New York this weekend and you were speaking at Cherry, yes. uh, Cherry Bomb. Mm. Um, I'd love to hear what you well, think about it's, that whole Well, it's a very difficult thing. I mean, obviously, I think that the Me Too uh, movement has um, highlighted many practices which um, are disturbing. And as someone, uh, I can't remember who, um, probably many people have remarked that those restaurants where they're so careful about um, how thoughtful they are about the food and you know the, how mm -hmm. well treated the animals are, sometimes Aren't their staff so well. are not yeah. treated as well. I, I don't th I think you know that historically the hospitality industry has not actually always been a very comfortable place for workers generally right. um, and something has to be done about that and I also think that this also includes paying people properly of course and when I was in New York I went to one restaurant and um, it, when they put you know what uh, gratuity you might you know you could voluntarily put on and put in it started as 18 percent suggested and it went up to 22. now if you're asking people to pay um 22 percent which is getting on for a quarter um you're not paying your staff properly and that actually is not a gratuity and you know that that it makes it in people can't afford to go out it is not an honest way of doing it. You know, in Australia, they do pay people more, and um, you're, it's for, yes, people say Australia is expensive, but I mean, you only get things to be very to be cheap if if you're underpaying people, and this, you know, the same is true in, in a lot of areas. Of course. Now, I'm not. I can't really speak to the Me Too movement, Me Too movement, particularly in in restaurants, because it's not my. It's not my field. It's not my world. And I always think that, you know, that I think that everyone has to, to take responsibility. But I think where you have people not being paid properly and being scared mm -hmm. for their, you know, their jobs, and I think in hotels it must be worse. Um, I think it must be absolutely awful for chambermaids in hotels. I hate to think of what happens there. And I don't suppose a lot of 
uh, them get much of a chance to talk and or are frightened to because I don't know um, whether, you know, what documentation they're on when they're working. And all these things matter an awful lot. But everyone has to take responsibility. And I think that means the customer as well. Because I think we know when we go to restaurants, if we think, we don't always know if, if people aren't being paid mm -hmm. properly, if... I mean, I often say when I see um, a tip added on, I will often ask the, the wait staff, Is this, does this go to you? And if it doesn't, I will give cash. Because I think that, ha you know, it's disgraceful if that is what happens. So I think it's, I think it's got to, the, the hospitality business has got to tidy up a bit. Definitely. Um, and, uh, but it's, but it's a hard one because, I mean, just like no one ever likes to say about when they talk about the great age of, you know, of, of democracies that, you know, whether they were, you know, the Greek or the British Empire, well, they do say, you know, it's all built on slavery. And that's how it works, because people are exploited and abused. And I'm afraid to say that a lot of things work in a financial way because the people are exploited and abused. And so you can't, you know, you, that's what makes things cheap. And we, whether, We've if be... we want to be complicit in that and carry on making sure, you know, and we often are. You know, people like want what they want. Who wants to pay more than they need? I mean, right. no one yeah. in their right mind. So I'm not saying, you know, but it, it, it's everyone is involved in this. So you've written an essay, uh, I believe, on just um, the role of women as, as home cooks and uh, the fact that sometimes when we look at, you know, home cuisine, we downgrade it. We don't think it's as mm. important as restaurant food. And a lot of the food that's being created in the home has been traditionally done by women. And you seem to have made that yes. connection. Well, I think that, you know, things on the whole, in society, uh, there are two things which make um, effort uh, valued. And one is if it's done by a male. And a corollary to this is also if it's paid for. And, and traditionally, cooking has been done by women unpaid in the home. So therefore, it's, it's seen as... Um, I mean, often it's, it's valued uh, sentimentally, but it, it, it hasn't been accorded a certain amount of respect. Um, but obviously, you know, all labor is honorable. And uh, in a way, I do think home cooks are creative cooks. Uh, I think that we, we look to the top, we, we compare the everyday home cook with the absolute top echelon of restaurant chefs, where we think they're creative, they do all these extraordinary things. But the reality is, in a restaurant, you are actually having to be pretty formulaic. Um, and in a home, you, you, you can be a bit more anarchic, I think. And I think you can sort of do what you want a bit more. You, 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 can, you can change a recipe a bit, depending on what you've got, because you haven't got people coming in expecting to have uh, something yes conformity conformity is very very important and rightly so um, in a in a restaurant kitchen whereas actually conformity is not that important at home and that's I think most people's memories of home food would be that you know it's a bit of this a bit of that and no one's really counting it doesn't have to be right. um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same but as I say it's it's a you know, we're not, we don't compare like with like when we compare restaurant chefs and home cooks. And both uh, pay a part. But as I say, there's no point. It, it, it's the wrong way of looking at it. Do you think there's a risk of home cooking changing now that we have more of the millennials coming on board who maybe aren't as interested in cooking at home and going I think out? That's, no, I think yeah. that's wrong. I am stunned by how many young people cook. Are you? And I, yes, I really am. I think young people cook a lot. And I think that... Uh, young men cook just as much as young women and not in the way that when I was young if a man cooked it was with a you know an awful lot of flourish and <laughs> not a lot of washing up and uh, now I do think that's changed a lot I'm what I see of young people and I see quite a lot of them that's interesting so you don't think it's gonna it's gonna be on the decline I don't, but you know what? Can I say there are two things which have, I have been told have been on the decline ever since I was very young. One is books, and the other is cooking. And you know what? They're they both, both continue, thank Yay. God. 
Yay. So, as a woman who's built a bit of an empire, you have a loving cookbook. Well, you say an empire. Uh, I haven't actually built an empire. I have written a load of books. I made some TV programs, but I don't have. I don't. Ha I mean, I don't know what you're meant to have as an empire. You know, I've only got one full-time person working for me. <laughs> I do have a few couple of. It's okay. You can still have part-time. I don't know if it counts as an empire. I mean, I think an empire has to carry on to, if you're just lying. If you're just lying around, you know, eating a grape. If I lie around <laughs> eating a grape, that's it. You're Nothing eating gets, more than that's grapes. That's it. Yeah, but you know what I mean. What, what advice would you give to, to women who are struggling to do a lot of different things in terms of finding balance and still being able to have a, a great career? I suppose like, this would be to women or men. I mean, because everyone needs balance in their lives. I mean, I don't feel... Um, I think... You can mix a lot of things. I mean, just you can't try and do everything. I think maybe that's, that's the point. I mean, I remember when I was uh, pregnant with my first child, a friend of mine said, I, mean, this is, I don't want to depress any young people here, but anyway, <laughs> a friend of mine said, you can have two lives, but you can't have three. <laughs> you can go out and have children, or you can work and have children, or you can work and you can go out. But what you can't do is go out, have children, and work. <laughs> and largely speaking, that's true. I mean, you can go out a bit, but you know, but so you, if you want to be someone who's going to endless courses and uh, going to classes one night and going to a, you know uh, some course another night and then to parties and then doing all that thing and travelling, and you want to have children and you want a job, you're never going to do all that. So, but you just got to choose one. You know, just leave out one sphere. And for me, go, leaving the going out sphere has been the most enjoyable. So you know how everyone always talks about FOMO? And um, <laughs> Oliver Berkman, I hope he coined the phrase, Oliver Berkman talked about JOMO, which is joy of missing out. <laughs> and I, I like cannot that. tell you I like that. how I just, I think, oh my goodness, what, you're going out now? Well, going out now, we just, you know, and all that. Oh, no, I for you. I, you know, so I, so I don't have that. I mean, I feel that it helped that I did an awful lot when I was young, but I, I sort of feel that um, maybe, maybe I don't, have, you know, I don't, my, I don't live my life on Instagram. I like posting food pictures and looking at other people's food pictures. But I, but if I look at a lot of people in a room and in a bar, I don't want to be there. Do you think we're missing out on something with everything having to be Instagrammable? Like, are we focusing too much on that and not mm. at the dish at hand? I'm going to think about I think, like everything else, it depends how you use it. It can magnify your pleasure, because I honestly believe an enthusiasm shared is intensified. Right. Or it can stop you being in the moment, because you're so worried about you know, whether it looks right. But I can I just hold my hands out there, which I drive my children completely mad because I won't let them eat until I've taken a picture. <laughs> so I, it's like, it's this very, very odd role reversal. Um, so I am that bad person. However, and if, but if I can't get it and it doesn't look right, I don't carry on with it. But I, but it's, but I have, actually, I, I took photographs of what I ate in the old days when you had to take, you know, the film to the uh, chemist to be <laughs> yes, developed. I remember those. So, um, so I don't know. So I think it, it just depends. I mean, I think much more about what is difficult about mm -hmm. that whole world is you've always got chatter in your head if you, if you have it on. I turn my, play, uh, my phone onto airplane mode <laughs> quite a bit because somehow, if I just have it there, I can sort of feel it's there. But once it's on airplane mode, I feel it's kind of remote and I, it buys me a bit of time because um, I do think I it's that it's being out crowded out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I like about cooking and eating is that somehow you're, you're focused on the food. So what advice would you give people in the audience who are you know, wanting to aspire to being a good home cook and take note of your cookbook says as a way to get there? Um, of... Well, it depends. I mean, it depends what stage you're at. If you're at a very beginning stage, I always say to everyone, just cook for yourself. Because um, the difficulty is a lot of people get enthusiastic and they don't really cook in the everyday for themselves. And then they suddenly want to cook you know, a big dinner, and it's very stressful, and they don't really know, you know, how food reacts when, you know, heat is applied, or they don't know what adding... No, no, I don't mean that in a... It, what I mean is, is that, you know, thing, different things do happen. You add, you know, you add something uh, acid, and it will 
behave in a certain way. And I, you sort of have to do it from experience. So I think that if you cook for yourself, you, things it, it doesn't. You're not that worried about things going wrong, and that gives you more freedom. And also may, means you're you're not just stressing about that. You're just actually paying attention. You're more relaxed. And about also, it. you have to pay attention to what you like. You have to cook for your own palate. Because that's the only way you can do it for tasting. And I also think, and this is an odd thing, I've written so many recipes, you just mustn't repeat, you must, you must repeat recipes, not you mustn't. You, you know, everyone always says, oh, don't get in a rut. Get in a bit of a rut, you know, first. Because I think when you repeat recipes, you, you get to know them so well that you don't really regard them as recipes. And indeed, you start adding different things because you just know exactly, you have an understanding of what that dish is. And so I think that's very important, and that's certainly what I do with my children. And I, and I think that makes it. And then, of course, do other things and add to that. But I, but I do think you can't feel that every time you cook, you're cooking something different. That would be unrelaxing, and it wouldn't teach you anything. So if we were to open your fridge today, and that's what people teach at school, isn't it? I mean, you're, you, it's, you're repeating things. You're going right. over and over. Yeah, to get to perfection. Um, if well, we were to perfection open, I don't <laughs> aspire to, but... <laughs> if we were going to open your fridge, what would we find in there? What, what do you like to, to prepare at home? Well, in my fridge, I would hope there would, be, there's, I would, hope there would always be some, a lot of leftovers from whatever I've been cooking. I am someone you who... You like to cook a lot when you when I you like, entertain, right? Yes, I do. I mean, when, when I'm trying to think about my fridge, I mean, it does... There are certain things that are always there, but I, it changes because I... Again, I suppose what's what's around. I'm certainly planning my fridge for when I get back. <laughs> um, there's nearly always I nearly always have Greek yogurt. I don't know why I find that's you know good in all sorts of cooking and in sort of in the sauce. I have bacon. Always have bacon. Have eggs, which I don't normally keep in the fridge, but I have so many of them. I have to have some there. We don't keep fri eggs in, in, in the England, fridge right? in England. No, yeah. we don't. Um, and I really can't be talking to people who keep tomatoes in the fridge either. <laughs> um, Nobody's going to admit that now. <laughs> and I think potatoes don't recover much if, even when they've been cooked, you put them in the fridge. It does something to them that they never, they, they go a bit grainy. I mean, sometimes you have to if it's very hot. I don't have that problem very often. Um, but I'm trying to think what I would have to start off with. And I think as long as I've got. Garlic, ginger, chilies, um, shallots, stuff. banana shallots, I'm a great believer in. It's much easier to peel the long ones, the scallions, I think. Um, spring onions, that's my sort of base Basics. thing. I would go to, you know, butter, ghee, fat, lard, dripping. And uh, of course. I think from there, yes, and, you know, frozen peas in the deep freeze and lots of vegetables in the vegetable basket. I think I can really do it. Very good tin sardines in the cupboard, canned can tomatoes. Uh, I think everybody's getting really hungry. I think hungry. that's always a chicken about the place. <laughs> well, we want to give everybody in the audience yeah. an opportunity to ask some questions. Yep, got it. I got it. Um, I'm actually so glad that you mentioned fries because now my question won't seem so odd. But if you could have potatoes one way for the rest of your life. If I could have potatoes one way. What, can I just ask you people, what is it always with questions that you always want to, you want to minimize the potential for pleasure? <laughs> that it's never, how many wonderful ways can you eat potatoes? What is one way? I need to you know. want to reduce it. It's I like, need to know. Everyone always asks that. Like, it's one thing, if you could only have one ingredient. Okay, one, one way of having potatoes. Yes, one way. Or two, I don't know. Thanks. I... You know what? I think there is. Well, I'm going to do two now. You see, you've given me, you've given me a bit of a loophole. Amazing. Okay, great. Uh, we have in England, we have Jersey Royals, new potatoes, and they are extraordinary. Or there are some. Anyway, they just taste. Uh, the soil they grow in is so wonderful. And for me, steamed new potatoes, um, just plain steamed with butter and maybe some fresh mint. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you just, say mint? Mint. Oh wow! Okay. Um, that is wonderful. But or, or just <coughs> butter and some some butter, salt, and uh, uh, white pepper. And sometimes you have the ones that grow near seaweed, and they are just <laughs> extraordinary. And otherwise, if I'm having that, then I suppose I would have to have 
chips prize. Um, but I, I, I'm a great believer in, or maybe you see, roast, no, proper roast potatoes, I think. That's, no, proper that's roast three ways. Potato. No, yeah, those are three cut dishes. the prize. <laughs> proper roast potatoes in goose fat or duck fat. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. Okay. I'm, I'm just very curious, as a mother and as someone who loves food, um, and with, with, sadly, with, I think, the, the fact that we're eating more in takeaways rather than, you know, at the family dinner table, do you think that that's unfortunately the future, or do you think that we might be able to, to get back to a point where we all sit down as a family and eat more often? Well, uh, they're, they're separate things in a way, because I think you can sit down as a family, but that doesn't necessarily mean everything has, has been cooked from scratch. And I think it is important to sit down together if you can. I mean, I just... But I don't think it's always possible for people to sit down and have a home-cooked meal from scratch every, every night. night. Um, I think lives are very busy, and it's, for a lot of people, actually, you know, it, it is an expensive option because you need a lot of time. If you, you need much more time if you're going to cook things which cost less. I think uh, so. I think it's possible to cook some meals from scratch for people, and not everything. But I do think that it's. It, I think it would be better to have some, you know, to sit around together and eat. And I would maybe start putting the emphasis there rather than sort of making people feel bad about what they can't manage in, the, in terms of fitting in with cooking. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hello. My first uh, encounter with you was on one of your TV programs. And I've always viewed you as a food celebrity as more of a, as, rather than a chef or that sort of thing. How does that happen? How did it happen for you, your first show, your first, because you're amazing on TV, you have a wonderful personality, as opposed to be going the restaurant route with okay. your career? How did I will, okay, so I, when, I, I did, when I did my first book, I didn't, I mean, at that time, I'd been a print journalist and I had done radio, but I'd never really wanted to do TV much. I'd done the odd um, thing about books or politics, but I didn't really, you know, TV wasn't, I didn't want to do it. I wrote my first book, and there was, it was serialized in magazines, and I was asked to do a TV series about it. And I said, well, of course not. You know, I don't want, why would I do that? And then I thought about it, and I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And so I said, well, if I can do it without being scripted, and, and I can do it at home, I'll, okay, I'll, you know, I'll try. And I did. And I found it, it was a bit awkward at first, and then I sort of found my way. I, but it didn't occur to me to be in a restaurant because I couldn't have. I mean, I'd washed up and I'd been uh, waited at tables, but I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't have the skills to work in a restaurant. Well, and it's of simply, owning one and... Yes, but it's, but why would I want to have something that means you have to stay up till <laughs> one in the morning? I mean, and, and you know, it, for me, that's not, you know, I like going to restaurants, but it's not how I, that's not the connections I make with people. Um, I mean, if I had some sort of dream place that was very, very small and you felt you knew the people there, that would be different. So I didn't, I was surprised I wanted the, to do the TV or it worked, but it's only because I just opened my mouth and bath and blather like I am now <laughs> that it feels like me. But if I had, if I were called upon to perform and re memorize something or, and all that, that, I'd find that difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I was yeah, I, know. Uh, I was just wondering, what is one of the most uh, cherished recipes that you've learned or grown up with? My cherished recipe? Well, I've sort of talked about my mother's chicken, so I don't really know in terms of cherished recipes. I mean, I feel that for me, um, it's a simple recipe, just making pancakes. And it always reminds me of, you know, making pancakes with my children. And although now I have moved on to the waffle. <laughs> um, but and you know, uh, you know there is there are a few finer meals than uh, waffles with maple syrup. I have to say, and I actually make the waffles now and I put them in my deep freeze, so I have them there ready at a at a moment's notice. And I think sometimes again, you know, earlier I was saying I'm not always to put the emphasis on whether you, what you're cooking from scratch. And the same is true with memories. Sometimes it's just that thing, you know, I rather love just hanging out with my children and we're eating something. And I really, yes, it's, I love cooking what they love. And I like, and, and I, I enjoy that. But actually it is just that thing of sharing something and it's cozy and it just feels that 
your home and that you've created that little safe force field around you at the table I like. I like that feeling. Thank you. I just warn you, we probably have time for about two or three more questions. I'll try and be faster. Okay. Yeah. I will tell him about short questions, and I'm realizing we're getting long answers. <laughs> <laughs> so over here, can you jump to the microphone? Are we okay? Can, you... if I, I, can, can we do, can we do we more go. than two if I promise to be quick? Yes. Yes, it's okay. okay. And I will project as well. One of the things I love about this city is that the whole world is in Toronto and we have access to a whole world of ingredients. In your opinion, is there a particular type of cuisine that you think is undervalued and you'd like to see people incorporate more into their daily lives? Um, I, well, actually, I, I haven't traveled well enough to know that. I'm not in the privileged position of knowing that. I do think people, it, what is quite interesting is that every, I mean, it's not a, I don't, I, you know, I'm not, Desperate. I'm not going to the barricades on this one, but the first one that comes to mind, and there may be many others, is German food. Everyone thinks that's a kind of joke, and it really isn't, especially German baking is wonderful. Um, and I think that Northern European food has always been slightly um, the unglamorous uh, the unglamorous sort of a part of culinary culture. And then the Nordic cuisines got their moment, whereas, you know, I do think that sort of Dutch and German uh, sort of baking and cooking are really interesting. It's just that we dream of the cooking of warmer climates. Sorry, I can feel Alison <laughs> looking like Phil. <laughs> we're, we're very warm here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi there. I just want to know, where do you like to go on vacation? Where do I like to go on vacation? Well, I love Italy. Um, I've, I'd love to do a bit more of Southeast Asia, but I, I'm, do you know what, I haven't, I'm not brilliant at vacations, it's not my strong, <laughs> it's not the thing I'm best at. <laughs> you, you recently wrote for Lenny, which was alluded to, and said to disparage an activity because it's traditionally female is in itself to be anti-feminist. Yes. And we're so lucky to have your books to inspire women and men who cook at home to do so with, with pride. Um, who were your mentors or people who inspired you to have your self-proclaimed title um, home cook? And um, Well, you know, my mother inspired me a lot, although I have to say I'm also against the idealization, idealization of the home cook. My mother bad-tempered a lot um, <laughs> and impatient. And I also feel that I know from my experience that Home cooks aren't just these wonderful nurturing creatures. We like we're con we're people who like to exert a certain amount of control. <laughs> so I think that you know it's, you've got to be careful about you know the glorification. But um, there are many you know, there are wonderful food writers that have inspired me. You know Jane Grigson uh, is one of them. Uh, Anna Del Conte. I think that there's you know that. Uh, and a lot more, and I'm very inspired now by a lot of the young women that I, who I see. Um, I think that if you can't learn from your youngers, you're, you know, you're in a pretty poor position. That's a lovely segue to our youngest. Oh. <laughs> she was so excited earlier yeah. tonight to meet Nigella. There. Um, when you were younger, were you a picky eater? And if so... <laughs> <laughs> and if so, what did you do to stop that happening? Okay, I was an incredibly picky eater. That's me. I didn't <laughs> like eating whatsoever. I didn't like eating a bit. I, I really hated meal times. That's and me. I found the more I cooked myself, the more I enjoyed food. So I think the way to do it, this may be going back to the control issue I mentioned. Yeah, because um, I'm a really picky eater. So yeah. yeah, well, that's fine. So just cook a bit more. <laughs> and you will, you know, and also your tastes do change over time. Um, so just enjoy what you enjoy. But do, be, always try. The rule I gave to my children is you don't have to eat everything, but you have to try everything. That's what my mom says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, so welcome to Canadian Spring. <laughs> uh, What's your favorite beer to drink or to cook with? My favorite beer? Yeah. Oh, my God. I, you know, I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> um, 
I have had some wonderful Belgian beer when I, you know, when I have been doing my tours of the Low Countries, and um, <laughs> but I haven't used an, you know, uh, an awful. I mean, I don't know enough. That's short. There's the answer. I mean, Guinness I use, but. I got the Guinness chocolate cake and I use it in soda bread sometimes too, and the, I've got a Guinness gingerbread. Yeah. But I mean, it, uh, you, you're not speaking to a connoisseur here, okay? <laughs> that, uh, you, you don't know, have I, to be, I'm you happy. just have to know what you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to try a bit more and find out there may, may be many other things to like too. Okay, so no one else is allowed to come no, up. It. <laughs> She's exerting her control. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for mentioning Anna de la Conte. I've just discovered her through your... Uh, closer to the microphone. Through your, um, I would say, documentary that you did. Yes, about Anna del Conte. What influence did she have on you besides olive oil and Mediterranean salt in the water? She also, she's, Anna del Conte is the one who taught me, I mean, this is years, decades ago, you know, always to use some of the pasta cooking liquid when you make a sauce. Um, and she, but she's a home cook, who is so erudite and uh, so interesting about what f you know the, how food has come to be in you know predominantly Italian food, and I think also she her first books uh, I found that they were so illuminating but very practical. They'd always told you how far ahead you could cook something, and I thought she she taught me that balance. Thank you. My pleasure. Nigella, hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm a big baker, and I learned how to bake from my grandmother, my mom, and you. Um, you. What got you baking, and what is your favorite dessert? Okay. Well, what got me baking is that I, I'd always thought that bakers and cooks were very different. Um, I was a cook and not a baker. Um, they, bakers just, were, they like doing very complicated things to a formula, and cooks with a spontaneous, you know, free creatures. Uh, but then I, when I was writing my first book, I thought, but you know, it's going to have a chapter on basics. So I've got to get to grips with the basics. And I realized I love baking, and I realized also it was a bit of a scam. It's not very complicated. You've just got one thing. You've got one thing going in the oven. You haven't got, you know, five different things going on at once, and you have to time them. Um, so I like that. And I don't have a favorite dessert. I'm very fond of the pavlova. I think that, for me, that's, you know, but... I, it, you know, I, I have very, you know, many, many. I love a lemon meringue pie. I don't make a good one, but I love one. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. So this is last question. Last, last question. Last question. Hi, I'm going to keep it really short. Um, uh, you, you're a wonderful writer, and you speak so well. I just wanted to ask you, somebody who's interested in cooking and eating, uh, and wants to be a food writer, what, what route should they take? What would you suggest? Like, what well, should they be thinking? Um. Well, all writers have to read. You cannot write unless you read a lot. And you don't necessarily have to read, you don't need to read about food. I think you need to get the taste of sentences in your mouth. And you then, despite the fact that you're reading a lot of other people's sentences, you've got to be very assured about your own because you've got to speak in your voice and write in your voice. So you have to write a lot and you have to read a lot. And um, just put, these days, you can put it out there. There's so many ways of doing that. But that's what I that's what I would say. Don't read someone and think I want to write like that. Obviously, you know, it, it's impossible to read someone without letting that style slightly rub off, rub off. But nevertheless, just do enough and find your own voice. My pleasure. Um, thank you. Let's have a round. Yeah.